thing. It's a very small question that is in front of all of you. Can the trees live without the birds? The trees, they don't take any rent also, and they have the, the nests with the birds they build over there. We get up with the chirpings of the bird. Birds, they help us in the pollination of the seeds. Birds are so much important, just like the butterflies, the honeybees, these are all the mitras, these are all the friends of trees. This is a popular Indian bird by the name of Maina. And what she is eating, she is eating worms. So can the trees live without the trees? Can the birds live without the trees? Can this bird live without the worms? It is her food. And where do the worms come from? The worms are coming from the soil. So the worm is eating the soil also. And soil is also the home for that worm, earthworm. So try to understand the connection that it is a web of life. This is a cycle, a chakra that we say. We cannot break it. God has made it. Mother Earth has made it. She is the sole custodian. Going deeper, earthworms. Earthworms, they are the scavengers of Mother Earth. They take care of everything, just like vultures and all. Yes. So everything, there is, you can say, a synchronization. There is a synergy. God has made it. Mother Earth has made it. We have to just take care of it. Okay, we have to preserve it. We don't have to destroy it. Then only the, our future custodians, that the students, the youth, their families, they would be taking care of our planet. Right now, what are the important problems that we all are facing? Maybe in the next slide, okay, you can yeah. see. I'm sorry to yes. interrupt. I know we, we reached the seven minute mark, but um, I'm hoping that you can bring some of this to our Q&A at the end. We can, we can ask you for some more of these concrete um, issues and solutions. No but problem, I apologize, no we problem. run out of time. <laughs> it's absolutely okay. Just like uh, what I wanted to uh, sure. make notice to all the people that we are part of this problem and we can only come up with the solution. And there is nothing to worry because uh, what, what I will say is that nothing is impossible, I am possible. We can come together. My, my key mantra to all of you and request to all of you is that Conserve everything, conserve biodiversity, conserve Mother Earth. We have a common home. That is the main thing. And yes, we can have a good future. It is our responsibility, collective responsibility. We have to take care of Mother Earth. If not now, then when? If not here, then where? And if not us, then who? Thank you. Thank you so much, Delopia. Your passion is coming through and we very much appreciate your presence with us today and look forward to the conversation during the Q&A because I know you have so much more to share with us, but thank you. You have shared with us already an inspiring account of the youth climate activists that you're working with. So thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to our second speaker now, Sister Anne James. Hello everyone. Hello, so I'm going to focus on two experiences I've been blessed to have in the uh, service of caring for creation. Um, my first was as a member of um, the JPIC committee, that's the Justice, Peace, Integrity of Creation Committee of the National Association for All Women Religious Serving in Zambia. So um, I was a part of this intercongregational team uh, of sisters, of religious sisters, that had the task of coordinating a three-year project entitled Care of the Earth, Our Common Home, uh, which had the objective of disseminating uh, the basic principles of Laudato Si, uh, Pope Francis's encyclical, and um, in eco-spirituality, as well as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So in the first phase of the project, some of um, our sisters were trained as facilitators, and so successively sisters from all over the country, that's Zambia, were then invited um, to send representatives to a training workshop in a central location, so that upon returning to their parishes and dioceses of origin, they would then be able to disseminate what they had learned. In the second phase of the project, uh, the sisters in the various branches of um, our national association spread throughout the country, uh, conducted these dissemination workshops involving people from all walks of life, uh, professionals, teachers, nurses, and also housewives and students, uh, civic authorities, church leaders, and traditional leaders. Uh, these in their turn, after being trained at the workshops, were then 
mobilized uh, by and, and with the sisters with their organizing committees to carry out the actual grassroots sensitization uh, activities. So these, um, these included um, tree planting drives, especially in schools, which of course involved very, uh, very much the students and their teachers. Uh, there were public cleanup exercises and also uh, peaceful public marches that uh, were conducted in, in the main streets of uh, uh, the, the, the main towns in their respective localities. Um, during these marches, pamphlets were distributed to the public, and, uh, which focused on the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And they were also uh, printed in various Zambian languages, just to get the word out there as, as much as we could. Now, in some localities, sisters also uh, mobilized local experts to create, uh, come up with radio programs and roundtable discussions uh, that further widened the impact of the sensitization work that they were doing. At the end of this uh, second phase of the project, all the work uh, culminated in a documentary that captured the success stories and celebrated all the good work that uh, communities around the country had done thanks to the very generous response of uh, our sisters uh, from all congregations present in Zambia. This documentary was then aired several times on uh, national television, uh, as well as on um, some private television networks. So uh, in my view, that's how, since we've, we've uh, seen the, uh, the, the expression climate champions uh, on our webinar today, I think that's how our sisters and the communities they worked with actually became climate champions in their own right and, and continue to be that. After I finished my work on this project at the national level of the church in Zambia, I moved to a project run by our sisters, the Komboni uh, Missionary Sisters in the Western province of Zambia. Uh, it's a very sandy place and um, it's, um, it's actually uh, facing uh, very much the, the, the risk and the, the threat of desertification. Uh, this project that we run there, Homboni Sisters, is known as the Mother Earth Project, which has several uh, dimensions. I was involved in one of those, namely in the Moringa Project. Uh, Moringa Leifera, also known as the Miracle Tree, is a drought-resistant tree, and is considered a superfood. It was introduced as a cash crop to Zambia some years ago. Uh, the Homboni Sisters had already been working for several years with communities uh, in the area on the outskirts of Mongu town. Uh, they worked mostly with rural farmers who were uh, mostly women. Over time, they had, and the farmers together with sisters had observed the declining fertility of their soils, as well as uh, declining uh, groundwater levels. Um, they also realized that the conventional chemical inputs uh, that were commonly used in, in farming were becoming more and more expensive. So uh, farmers were really in a dilemma as to the, the sustainability of their future. So thanks to some trainings that were offered um, locally, um, some of which were also organized by uh, our sisters, the farmers decided that the way forward was to go in a big way into uh, sustainable organic agriculture, as we saw also early in the earlier presentation, um, while at the same time taking up the cultivation of Moringa oleifera, which actually adapted quite well to um, the, the, the soils of, uh, of Mongo. So that's where the factory that we sisters uh, built with donor support on the premises of Mother Earth Center comes in. Uh, how we support farmers apart from giving them training in sustainable organic agriculture is to buy the harvests of their uh, moringa leaves, which they bring to us, and then process them into a powder, which is then packaged and sold in the local market as uh, um, a food supplement or a superfood. And many of the women farmers report that um, uh, the consumption and the growing of moringa leaves has helped their own health and the health of their families in general, um, as also of their farm animals, because that's how uh, nutritionally rich the plant is. Um, moreover, the income from the sale of the leaves has helped them to keep up with the payment of school fees for their children, enable them to access some um, medical treatment uh, when the need arises. And some women farmers have even reported that this income has really helped them as um, a buffer against um, poverty, um, as when they have to maybe start all, all over again after the loss of a spouse 
or uh, after even a, a divorce from a life partner. So these women farmers are also climate champions in their own right, I believe. And through the cultivation, the organic cultivation of uh, Moringo Leifera, as well as other traditional um, crops, they are really trying um, and managing to preserve, I believe, a way of life, as well as the sustainability of their farmlands and of their livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Anne James. Uh, your presentation today has really um, inspired us. You've reminded us that ecological education and action must go together to create change. Um, thank you for introducing us to your climate champions as well, and to the <laughs> farmers who are involved in sustainable agriculture and really are benefiting um, from an enhanced livelihood, health, and, and education. So we are very much inspired by your work and that of your climate champions. Thank you. Our third presenter today is Mon Ms. Kanna Mandel um, from the Sundarbans in India. Her presentation today will be given by video. She is present with us, but because of internet connectivity issues, we're going to show her presentation as a video, and then she'll be available for the questions and answers later on. So if we have our video ready. I am Kona Mundul. In my childhood, I had to struggle a lot. We are many sisters and my father was a tailor master, earning very meek. I am Kona Mundul. In my childhood, I had to struggle a lot. We are many sisters and my father was a tailor master, earning very meagerly. When I was 15 years old and was about to write my school leaving exam, my father suddenly passed away. To support the family and to continue my education, I started giving tuitions. There was hardly any pay at that time. Around the year 1995-96, a skill development training program was organized in our block. It was uh, basically on katha stitch, where one had to learn those stitches on saris and dress materials and sell it in the market. It was a six months training program which I completed. And after that, I met the general manager of the district industrial center. I told him about my training and asked if I could do something. Now to do something meant to start a business which required a certain amount of finance, which I did not have. But still, I did not give up. I arranged for some money, around 1 to 2,000 rupees, purchased some cloth with it, did embroidery work on them and sold them in, to the people in the village. Gradually, other women started joining me and under my uh, training and leadership, you know, we started doing embroidery on pieces of cloth and sell to the people in the village as well as we went to other villages. Gradually, women from other villages of different age groups started joining my group and initially we were a group of 10 women and we formed a self-help group. Soon I started visiting offices in Kolkata taking orders as I needed money. I used to bring saris from my customers and return them after the embroidery was done. In this way I was earning money and so were the other women in the group. The district rural development cell recognized our self-help group 
and granted us a loan for our business. Along with this work, I was continuing with my studies and I completed my graduation simultaneously. My life has had always been full of challenges. Since I come from the Sundarbans district, which is a very remote place, and every year it is affected by natural calamities like floods and tsunamis, we fight a continuous battle here. The COVID pandemic affected the lives of the people adversely. People were helpless, starving to death, and <clears throat> I, with my group of women, tried to arrange rations for the people. It was not only the pandemic. The two cyclones, Amphan and Yash, left many people homeless. We tried our best to reach out to them, take them to the flood relief centers, cook food for them and that way we helped more than 2,000 families. The super cyclone Amphan stole our sleep and we spent many sleepless nights in the flood centers helping the people with food and medicine and drinking water. The lives of the people in Sundarvans was completely devastated, especially pregnant women and children. Some of them even spent nights on the roads. But we continued our battle to help the people and save them from starvation and death. We have been doing our best and we hope to continue our battle for the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Kana, for sharing your deeply inspiring personal story of economic empowerment and resiliency in the face of climate change. You have shown us how women are working together to support not only themselves and their families, through their economic endeavors, but also providing care and community support during climate disasters. Your story illustrates not only the reality of climate change in the Sundarbans, especially recent flooding and cyclones, and its intersection with the COVID-19 pandemic, but the resilience of women in overcoming challenge and lifting up a community in need. Thank you. We'll move now to our fourth presenter, Dr. Farah Mozeni. And we also have a video presentation from Dr. Mozeni, and she is available for the Q&A at the end of our session. Greetings, everyone. My my name is Farah Mazani. I am an assistant professor at the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Lehigh University. I am very excited to be here. Um, to give you a background about myself, I, um, I was born and raised in Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. Um, and um, I, uh, I did my studies, uh, early studies uh, there, uh, including my bachelor and my master's um, studies. And Iran is a very uniform and homogeneous environment. I literally didn't know anyone uh, growing up who was not from Iran. So we basically would speak the same language with different accents and everybody practiced the same language. So culturally, it was very, very homogeneous and very uniform. So um, I decided to, to go somewhere else. I decided to explore the world. I decided to know myself, uh, which is why I moved to the United States to pursue my PhD. And I went to University of Nevada, Las Vegas, because of a very great lab that was located in Nevada Desert Research Institute that I wanted to go there to do my PhD. 
one um, turning point in my life was this decision because I moved from a very uniform environment to an extremely diverse environment at UNLV. Uh, if you were waiting five minutes on campus, you could hear like at least five different languages. So that's how diverse it was. And it helped me to, to learn about myself, to explore my interests, and um, to to uh, to <clears throat> to look for what I wanted to do and what I, who I wanted to be. So um, I'm glad I did that, even though it was scary. I was on my own and I had to learn everything on my own, a different language, different culture. I I literally didn't know anyone in the United States. So uh, this was a great experience um, that I gained um, um, on you know during that. For during those four years at UNLV. Um, right after I, uh, I finished my PhD, I started my first job at a company, um, uh, which was a manufacturing company. And uh, this was another life changing, you know, experience, because uh, very soon I learned that um, diversity is not the case everywhere you go in the United States. So my colleagues were all uh, raised and you know um, and grow in in uniform environments, and they were not very accustomed to having uh, a female colleague, let alone a female boss, because I was young and um, I had an accent, I had black hair, uh, I was a foreigner that they didn't you know they were not used to have around. And I was the only woman in the entire, you know, the technical team, not like the office and so on. But uh, it was very challenging for me because I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show them that I'm capable and I wanted them to listen to me because I like they would often dismiss my authority just because of all of the things that I said at first. Uh, but um, after five or six months, um, everything turned out differently. So they, they learned that, hey, I am young. And so I am familiar with new technologies that they had no idea. So the combination of my education and their experience uh, created a very uh, creative team, really. So that, you know, it was very successful and um, challenging, but turned out to be one of the most precious experiences in my life. And I'm, I'm still in touch with them, uh, with my former colleagues and we have a great relationship uh, and um, uh, uh, that you know formed my my experience in the coming years after that then I went to Penn State as a faculty of environmental engineering and then I started my job at Lehigh University in 2021 which has been the greatest uh, you know job that I have ever had that I have ever had uh, at Lehigh, my research is really focused on resilience of interconnected critical infrastructures, where I study the links between different systems of water, you know, power system, buildings, transportation, to see how we can use these interlinks to improve the performance of the entire urban systems and how we can make sure that these systems are resilient when there is a disaster or when there is you know a catastrophic um, event um, and uh, usually because usually these interlinks propagate the failure from one system uh, across all different systems and uh, my my work is really focused on how to prevent that um, but I don't want to get into the technicality of it. I would like to finish uh, my presentation with a little uh, advice, uh, if I may, that uh, don't be afraid of trying new things. Don't be don't be scared of exploring new areas that are very, very you know, new to you. And even even though if you have to do something on your own and if you are the only woman in in an entire company uh, and if you or if you have an accent uh, that other others don't and if you are different and you look different don't be afraid of that that can turn uh that can turn into really really amazing experience that you don't want to miss i have been there it's a scary it's fearful but i think it's required for you to grow and uh, to to succeed in the in your future uh, professional and personal life Thank you so much for your time and for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Mozeni, for Mozeni. sharing some of your personal experiences with us. Your experience of studies in Tehran and in the US 
moving from a homogenous culture to one that is more diverse, as well as your experience of working as a woman in a male dominated field have provided some valuable lessons that you've shared with us today. So thank you for that. These experiences have obviously informed the way you approach your work. Thank you also for the little taste of your research um, on the resilience of interlinked critical infrastructure. And I hope that we'll have a chance to learn more about it during our Q&A session. Thank you. Our fifth presenter today is Ms. Pranita Rani of Terramitra. I would invite her to share her presentation now. Are you ready, Panita? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, Media Group in Gujarat. Uh, students at Tarumitra headquarters in Patna, Bihar. So I am here. Second one. In Gujarat, I went to Gujarat in 2018. Part of Students are enjoying during the camp. Yes, sister. Hello. Next. Is founder uh, of Tarumitra, Father Rob Ethical. Patna, nearby Ganga Ghat. School students came from Vidya. I'm preparing food. This is a part of residential camp at Tarumacha Patna. I learn Paddy planting in the organic farm in Tarumitra. She is a sister from Gujarat. Tarumitra match putting. 
putting on the thermometer patch to system in Gujarat. Eco-friendly Diwali with Father Robert Ethical at Santi Sadhan in Pryagraj, Uttar Pradesh. Students celebrated eco-friendly Diwali. Kerala visit. I went along with the school students from Vaitya. Tying Rakhi on the trees on the occasion of Raksha Bandha. School visit in Vietnam, Vanuka School, Sisters Organization. Once again, Gujarat trip. Helping in kitchen, Didi's and Bhaiya's. Part of learning. Students preparing uh, morning breakfast in camp. Thank you, Pranita. Have you finished your presentation? You still have two more minutes. Yes. Uh, along this PPT, I worked on a uh, river, uh, Chandravat River is in Vetiya. I worked along with uh, school students. Since 2015, students and volunteers have strived hard for freedom. This freedom is about freedom from pollution from the famous Chandravat River that flows there. This river was convert, converted into a drain because of human activities. But continuous efforts of this display girl via road shows, street plays, cleanliness drives, meeting with government officials, municipal corporation, personal district magistrate, police, forest department has ringed in the revival of Chandravat River. Still, it has a long way to go. Chandravat River as a model of inspiration for other water bodies in our country. Let's free our rivers and other natural resources which are given to us by Mother Earth from the havoc of man-made pollution. So now uh, cleaning is started by Manrega scheme. Manrega scheme is a government scheme of Bihar. So I hope that next generation will see this river fully clear and holy river. So I worked on this river. I'm working now, I'm working on this river. So thank you so much. Thank you, Pranita, for your presentation. Um, I think we're all inspired by the youth climate activism taking place um, and sponsored by Terramitra. Activities like tree planting, visits in the schools, paddy planting and harvest, and so many other activities that you showed us through your, through your photos. Your passion and commitment to climate justice really shines through your presentation and the work that you're doing right now on saving the rivers. You are a hope uh, for all those engaged in climate justice. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Ma.
Our uh, sixth and final speaker for today is Dr. Hilda Koster. So I would invite Dr. Koster to share her presentation with us. Good day to all of you. I'm speaking to you from Toronto and it's an honor and pleasure to be part of this wonderful panel. And many thanks to the organizers and the other speakers for giving such powerful presentations. I'm an associate professor at the University of St. Michael's at the University of Toronto, where I direct the Elliot Allen Institute of Theology and Ecology. So I'm going to read part of my lecture and then I will share so, some slides as well. So forgive me for reading. My remarks today connect climate and gender justice in critical conversation with Pope Francis' 2050 encyclical, Laudato Si on care for our common home. And some of you already mentioned that encyclical as a context for your work. Climate change is real and affects everyone. Yet, as we heard from some of our panelists this morning, um, for two poor and indigenous women, especially in the majority world, the effects of climate change are often life-threatening. Not only do women and gender the first person constitute the majority of the world's poor, they also are more vulnerable due to climate change due to intersecting and multiple sources of marginalization, such as lack of access to education, adequate health care, and lack of access at, uh, to political representation. The COVID-19 pandem pandemic has made these inequities only more life-threatening. For this reason, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, called on the global community to make gender justice the lens for post-pandemic recovery and for building just ecologically sustainable communities. Churches and ecological theologians have been at the forefront of calling attention to climate change induced vulnerabilities and have urged world leaders to address climate change through the lens of climate justice. And I will focus on, on churches and Christian theologians because I am a Christian theologian. Arguably, however, it has been Pope Francis' 2015 Green Encyclical, La Data C, that has most has importantly shaped recent public discussion on the moral and spiritual challenges of climate change, especially leading up to COP21 and COP26. To many, both inside and outside the Catholic Church, Laudato Si is a remarkable document. It offers a comprehensive analysis of our global crisis and provides a refreshingly clear and necessary resistance to oppressive structures inherent in the logic of neoliberal capitalism. This is especially true as the encyclical invites all people of goodwill to embrace an integral ecology that is rooted in the proper view of the human person in relation to other humans, the earth and God. Channeling the liberation theologian Leonardo Boff, Pope Francis famously insists that and I quote, a true ecological approach always becomes, becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Elsewhere, Francis says, quote, we are faced with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature, end quote. Integral ecology is an important way to address the multi-level interdependency of our social and ecological lives. It also offers a vision for the right ordering of society that serves both the human and the more than human world from the perspective of the preferential option for the poor and the earth. Not surprisingly, integral equality played a vital role in the development of the final document of the 2019 Synod for the Pan-Amazonian region that emphasized the preferential option for indigenous people. Yet while Laudato Si insists that we reorder society from the perspective of a preferential option for the poor, 
and the indigenous, it does not name the day-to-day -day struggle for survival of poor and indigenous women facing the effects of climate change. Nor does the Pope draw on the experience of women activists fighting extractive industries, let alone mention the work by Catholic ecofeminist theologians, such as Rosemary Redford-Ruter, Elizabeth Johnson, or Ivona Cabrera, who have been writing on ecologies for decades. And then let me share a few slides here. Can you see my share, my slides? No. So here it is at least the kind of things that Laudato Si um, does not do uh, uh, and that I just listed. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And here are the ecofeminist theologians, a few ecofeminist theologians uh, that are not mentioned in Laudato Si. When the Pope does address gender, it is done through complementary uh, complementarity that reinscribes heteronormativity and heterosexism. Six -sex sexism, in the words of Catholic feminist ethicist Lisa Cahill, in Laudato Si, women's agency is, quote, essentialized, romanticized, politically subordinated, or entirely neglected, end quote. Catholic Latina theologian Melissa Pocan connects the gender ideology operative in Laudato Si with the logics of colon coloniality. That is the way power and capital have objectified land and the bodies of subjugated peoples, in particular women, and rendered them extractable. In order to disrupt and subvert this colonial logic, Pekin argues in favor of a decolonial feminist integral ecology. An integral ecology that privileges the situated knowledges of brown, black, and indigenous women most impacted by resource extraction and climate change. She says, and I quote, we must understand that those who have historically been constructed as not knowing or not being ought to be granted an epistemological privilege in our cultivation of an integral ecology, end quote. Such an epistemological privilege allows for a plurality of knowledges that in return persist, quote, the re-articulation and re-inscription of epistemic and ontological domination that is intertwined with ecological domination, end quote. Next slide, please. An example of such a decolonial feminist e integral ecology is the book Planetary Solidarity, Global Women's Voices on Christian Doctrine and Climate Justice that I edited together with a Korean-American theologian, Kray Shizun Kim. This book gathers, gathers a rich chorus of queer, Black, Hispanic, and indigenous feminist voices. While the first, the first, the thread running through the book is that of a rich incarnational theology that sees the earth as God's body and God's spirit as its bread. It is from this body that we, that we emerge and it is this spirit, which is the spirit of God's justice-seeking and earth-honoring love, that nurtures a deep solidarity with the earth and all vulnerable people. It is my conviction that wherever this solidarity takes hold, the spirit of the sacred becomes flesh, creating fresh possibility for life on this fragile planet. The good news is that this spirit is a renewable energy. And we heard about this, this, this spirit today in, in many of the presentations. It is a renewable energy. We won't use it up, but only multiply it when we tap into it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koster. These are all the women, the chorus of women who 
contributed to the book that I just talked about. And these women come from all over the globe. So, and rather than talking about the, um, the, the earth as our common home, these women talk about the earth as our source of life. And they talk about kinship rather than stewardship. So that what we need to nurture is kinship with one another, but also with the more than human life forms with which we are in relation and on which our life depends. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koster, for your engaging presentation on Laudato Si and its impact on public discussion of climate change, and notably the absence of women's voices from that discussion. You present a compelling critique of Laudato Si's human-centric position and the lack of inclusion of diverse voices, especially those of women, although they're often working on the ground in climate justice, as we have heard about today. You have offered us new possibilities for an incarnational theology one that sees the earth as God's body and God's spirit as its breath and the implications for change that can emerge from this body. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you to all of our panelists for your presentations today. I would invite now my colleagues Meg Lynn and Liz to open up our time for the Q&A. Hello everyone. Um, thank you all. Thank you to our speakers and Sarah. Um, so we'll open up for our Q&A session right now. Um, there was one question from the chat box from Paola Mogi. If, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, but your question was, um, women gatherers preserve and value biodiversity, which is very important in time of crisis, like war and extreme weather conditions. They know and use um, wild plants, which grow with no or little care and can resist drought and flood. How is this knowledge of theirs promoted and passed on to younger generations? Um, can anyone from our panel um, from our panel um, answer this question? Um, Devo, um, Devo Priyadara, do you have an answer for this question, if you may? Um, Can you just come, um, come up with the question again? Yes, of course. So, yeah. um, Paula's question was, women gathers preserve and value biodiversity, which is very important in time of crisis, like war and extreme weather conditions. They know and use wild plants, which grow um, with little or no care and can resist drought and flood. How is this knowledge of theirs promoted and passed on to younger generation? Yes, uh, biodiversity. This is a very complex, complicated term, but it's very easy. Bio means living and diversity means varieties and selections. In my past six years that I have been working with the students, uh, with the corporates also, with the organizations also, I learned much more from the indigenous groups. Yes, from the women, from the families, going to the villages, their groups, self-help groups. They have much more knowledge. I have seen that how through one plant only, they can make edible stuff. They can eat it. They can cook it. They can use it as medicine also. And they can like preserve it also, biodegradable. So women and girls, especially in the rural areas, indigenous groups or those who live closer to nature, they have much more ideas. So what we do that whenever, I mean, what, uh, what personally I have been doing and I have seen in Tarumitra, uh, also, like you saw in Pranita's uh, uh, PPT, that a lot of cooking was done during the Tarumitra camps. Yes, when we go to various places uh, all over, we engage the local children also, especially the girls and the females, women, and we ask them that, what is your common uh, culinary over there? What is the common recipe, this and that? And they come up with fantastic part. 
so my idea would be engaging them in a feast we call it as a eco feast cooking together where everybody is coming up with some ingredients of the local place and this is how like you are cooking up a recipe but while eating only while feasting only you are sharing uh, your knowledge also and this is how the uh, campers if the campers are from the school or the college they also get experiences so i hope you understood my one example that how we can engage the younger generation by doing work in community and taking them closer to nature for a picnic for a camp and in involving the locals over there and the families and communities together then they start understanding okay this is a part of biodiversity slow and steady wins the race in my case thank you thank you so much um anyone else any other panelists want to add to that question um if not i hope that answers your question paula and feel free to um input any other um questions in the chat box but meanwhile we have some questions for our panelists um and our first question is um in your opinion what is the most significant risk to women and girls when it comes to climate change and climate related disasters um Um, I'll direct this question maybe to um, Dr. Um, Koster, if you can, if you have an answer to this question. Um, so, what is the most significant risk to women and girls when it comes to climate change? Well, I think that someone who is from a different part of the world than I am is better. Um, 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 you know, I can I can talk from theory. And I think it's good to have someone speak to this question from practice, from lived experience. Okay, um, how about um, Pranita? Um, are you available to um, answer this question? So in your opinion, what would be, what is the most significant risk to women and girls when it comes to climate change and climate related disasters? Um, Pranita, are you there? Are you able to answer the question? Uh, we should give chance to girl and women, and uh, we should just support support them. So they can do uh, everything, but just support. They need to uh, support from other side, from family members, from uh, school, from institutions like thank you um um anyone else want to add into this question um how about and james hi uh, yeah um i mean i think it, it's quite obvious especially uh, for mothers as i think one of the other uh, presenters um mentioned um you know they really feel the risk to their families their children. I think Kana, this is Kana Mondal spoke about pregnant women, how they were hit by um, the, I think the tsunamis and the thunderbugs. So um, they really, I mean, we women are on the front lines of uh, whatever happens in, in any impact on to our communities and, and to our lands. So um, um, many cases, women who, who are heading their families on their own, uh, really feel it when they have to, uh, when they're, all, they're all the sole breadwinner in a family and their livelihoods come crashing when they lose their lands or, or um, their, their farm animals. So they're really directly, um, you know, impacted in, in climate disasters, definitely. In my part of the world, uh, so that's, uh, um, you know, um, also, what, what we learn uh, through studying the literature that women are impacted when but water becomes uh, more scarce um, uh, and it becomes more difficult to collect um, that affects um, women's daily tasks and it might mean that girls need to uh, help their mothers or their families and cannot go to school things like that 
In my part of the world, um, the problems are also very much related to resource extraction, which is, of course, indirectly related to climate uh, change. Our, our excessive um, need for uh, oil and for gas. And in the areas where oil is extracted here in Canada uh, and in, in the United States, it's often close to indigenous um, lands. And uh, it comes with a lot of threats to indigenous communities and also the safety of indigenous women and girls. So that's a really huge concern in our part of the world. Thank you so much. Um, um, so far, we haven't got any other questions from the chat box. Um, everyone in our, um, all the attendees, feel free to um, ask any questions. Um, meanwhile, um, we have another question for our panelists. Um, I guess um, we'll start up with um, what has been the most important or significant work that you have done so far? And I wish all the panelists can join and speak about their um, important experiences so far. And we can start with um, Devil Priya. Yes, you can come up with the question. I'm ready. Okay, um, so the question was, what has been your most important or significant work so far? that you have achieved so far at Tar um, Taramitra? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> For me, each day is a new day, I will say so. Even small, small achievements also give me a lot of vigor and zest. But yes, for me, one thing is changing the mindset of people. For example, if I'm going to a school with a program, with an invitation, for example, Earth Day is coming. Maybe the principal will say that, what will you do in just one day, 22nd of April? Then I will say, no, it is just the beginning. New academic session is coming. But if the principal says that not, not only this Earth Day, we have, you have to uh, chalk out a green calendar for, for the whole school. Then I see that, okay, if the principal uh, is also having the, the, the same attitude, the mindset, then that work becomes easy for me. And when out of 100 students, if I'm like sharing a story or any activity, one or two also at the end and they come up and they say, ma'am, what next? So that thing, out of 100, if I'm getting uh, one feedback, just like a farmer is, you can say, uh, broadcasting the seeds in the farm, and out of that, only one or two only germinate, that farmer is happy. I do not believe in quantity, but I believe in quality. Changing the mindset of people and the way I think, and I have a, a broad vision, open-minded thing that, okay, I'm ready to also learn from them. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to grasp from them. That gives me satisfaction. That gives me satisfaction each and every day. One program done, 30 schools came together, did the program, came in the press, uh, shared it in the media. That is just, you can say 30% of that. But 100% satisfaction is that if it is implemented also. So that gives me happiness that, okay, I'm able to change the mindset of people. More and more people are joining me. For example, Pranita over here, she has been associated with Tarumitra for the past 14 years. Okay. And I have seen her, she is younger to me, but seeing her right now, she's having her examination also. Her BA examination started from yesterday, but see, seeing her zest and all, that is giving me more energy. Her presence in this platform is giving me a lot of strength. So like-minded people, somebody is from Toronto, somebody is from Sundarbans, language is never a problem. When like-minded people are, are, are coming together, that gives me a, a, a lot of energy. When, when people come up with a common thing, Yes, that is my, you can say, a significant achievement each and every day because we people, we can, we, we can never be satisfied. We always want more. We always want more. That is the human need, okay? So I cannot be satisfied with one small significant ach achievement. But yes, one thing in my city that I did three years back was bringing uh, earth movers to my city instead of uh, uh, cutting the trees, that was uh, for the name of green and smart city and converting my city into a metro. For three years, along with students, I went to the municipal corporation, to the mayor of the city and many other government officials. And after, uh, you can say a lot of, you can say running around with the help of students who led the program, we were successful enough, happy enough to bring earth movers to the city, which, which could translocate and uh, uh, relocate trees from one end of the city to another end of the city and so that the trees would not be chopped off. 
so earth movers coming to my city uh, was you can say one important achievement for me satisfaction for me that i will always remember thank you thank you very much sofia um and i'll move on to kana who have an answered our any of our questions um so the question it'll be the same question um what has been your most important or significant work can i translate this question for kana in bengali to her yes of course thank you kana tumi ki amake shunte pachcho jodi shunte pachcho to nije ki unmute kore ha ami shunte pachchi ma'am ha ma'am ami shunte pachchi ঠিক আছে তোমাকে এটা জিজ্ঞেস করা হচ্ছে কি আজ পর্যন্ত তুমি যত কাজ করেছো তোমাকে সবচেয়ে বেশি খুশি তোমাকে কি কি তোমাকে দিয়েছে মানে যা কাজটা তুমি যে করছো ওখানে মানে খুব ভালো কাজ করছো কোনটা তোমাকে ভিতর থেকে অনেক আনন্দ দেয় মানে যেটা তুমি মনে করো আমার प्रशिक्षण गो दिए जो तस गेले टाड़ी नहीं जाए तक तसार मान हेल्प करी करते इंजिनियरिंगशाल মানে আনন্দের এবং ভালো লাগে তারপরে আরেকটা কথা হলো যে অত্যাচারিত অনেক মহিলা আছে যাদের স্বামীরা মানে তাদেরকে অত্যাচার করে তাদেরকে ছেড়ে দিয়েছে ডিভোর্স দিয়েছে তাদেরকে আমি আমার কাছে টেনে নিয়েছে তাদেরকে আমি যখন আমি প্রশিক্ষণ দিয়ে তারা যখন এখান থেকে ইনকাম করে যখন বাড়িতে নিয়ে যাচ্ছে তারা সুস্থ ভাবে বেঁচে থাকছে সেক্ষেত্রে আমার মানে আমি খুবই খুশি এবং আমার মন থেকে আমি সেটাই ভাবি যে না এরা ভালো আছে আমার সঙ্গে সঙ্গে তারা আছে বিধবা মায়েরা আছে বিধবা মা আছে কিছু যাদের হচ্ছে ছেলেরা ছেলে পুলে নেই হয়তো আছে অন্য অনেক দূরে আছে তাদেরকে দূরে সরিয়ে রেখেছে সে সমস্ত দিক থেকে তাদেরকে হেল্প করে আমার ভালো লাগে আর সব থেকে মানে একদম সব থেকে ভালো যেটা হয়েছে এই যে প্যান্ডামিক তো আছে প্যান্ডামিক এর সঙ্গে সঙ্গে যখন আমাদের সুন্দরবনে যে আমফান যেটা হলো আমফান ঝড়টা হলো সেখানে সেখানে কি অবস্থা মানে যেতে গেলে সাত আট মাইলের মাইলের পর মাইল আমরা পায়ে হেঁটে গিয়ে যখন দেখছি যে তারা জলে ডুবে আছে তারা এই যে তারা জল খাবে যে কল যে পাম্পের যে কলের যে জল সে কলগুলো যখন ডুবে আছে জলের যেন হাহাকার একটু জল নেই একটু খাবার নেই যখন আমরা ওদের জন্য জলগুলো বয়ে নিয়ে যাচ্ছি হ্যাঁ জলগুলো মুখে দিচ্ছি তাদের জন্য খাবার আমরা বানিয়ে নিয়ে যাচ্ছি তাদের জন্য ড্রাই ফ্রুট নিয়ে যাচ্ছি হ্যাঁ তখন আমরা যখন দিচ্ছি তারা যখন একটু প্রাণে বেঁচে আসছে এবং অনেক প্রসূতি মায়েরা আছে তাদের মানে খুবই অবস্থা খারাপ তারা না যেতে পারছে ডাক্তারের কাছে কোথায় যাবে কিভাবে যাবে রাস্তাঘাট জলে ডুবে গেছে হ্যাঁ তো তাদের থাকার জায়গা নেই এদিকে সাপ পোকা মাকড় মশা কোথায় যাবে কি খাবে যখন আমরা তাদের পাশে দাঁড়াতে পেরেছি আমি সব থেকে আমার ভালো লেগেছে আর বাচ্চা ছোট ছোট বাচ্চা গুলো সেই বাচ্চা গুলো খাওয়ার জন্য হাহাকার করে বেড়াচ্ছে কান্নাকাটি করছে তাদের হাতে যখন আমরা মানে খাবার তুলে দিতে পেরেছি আর নদীর যখন এটা আমফানটা হলো ঝড়ে তো নদীতে তো পুরো সব এক হয়ে গেল তো আমরা তখন কি করলাম গভর্নমেন্ট তো অত তাড়াতাড়ি ওদেরকে কিছু করতে পারে না একটা টাইম লাগে তো আমরা টেম্পোরারি তাদের থাকার জন্য যে ঘর গুলো আমরা করে দিয়েছি মানে আড়াইশোর উপরে পরিবারকে আমরা টেম্পোরারি রাস্তার উপরে আর কি ঘর যখন আমরা করে দিয়েছি যখন তারা সেখানে গিয়ে দুটো খেতে পেয়েছে তখন তার থেকে শান্তি আর মানে কিছু পাইনি মনে হচ্ছে যে আমরা কিছু করতে পারলাম আর মনের শান্তি শান্তিতে একটু ঘুমোতে পারলাম এটাই আমার সব থেকে বেশি মানে সাকসেসফুল আর কি এটা খুবই ভালো খুব ভালো হ্যাঁ আমি এগুলো বলে দিই ঠিক আছে হ্যাঁ আমি এগুলো বলে দিচ্ছি খুবই ভালো ওয়াও আই মিন 
I would have loved to listen more and more of her because so many things have given her satisfaction. First is that uh, when women trainees go to her for the training, uh, for the embroidery and all, uh, so every month they get their salary honorarium. So that is one thing that gives her satisfaction that yes, these women are earning through my skills that I'm teaching them. Secondly, also these families, I mean, from where the women they go and uh, they learn all the embroidery and other skills from her. So their families from their families, sons, daughters, their examination, the fees, somebody has applied for engineering, somebody for medical, they are able to pay the fees, enroll their name. So for education for future also, uh, when, when the monthly salary goes, that also gives us satisfaction all the time. And many of our students who come and uh, learn this uh, uh, vocational skill from her embroidery, many of them are widows, many of them uh, are uh, victims of domestic violence also. But when they are getting empowered by getting some money through the embroidery work that they are learning, that also gives her a lot of satisfaction. And uh, one of the last things that she said last year, uh, in West Bengal, West Bengal, uh, from the state where she hails, it had a cyclone by the name of Amphoon, and it was terrible over there. And it was all over the TV, all over the, you can say, uh, in the newspapers in the country. So government also came into action, but before the, the government officials came for help, what she did was, she did temporary arrangement, accommodation, temporary accommodation for 250 families, along with her locals, with her helps, and she arranged drinking water for them, food for them, medical help for them. And when the kids and the families, they smiled at her, that brought a smile on her face. So this is really commendable that Kana shared that all these significant achievements of her has made me also proud. And I think all the people who are in this platform today over here. Congratulations to you, Kana. Thank you. Thank you, Kana and Davapriya for translating. Um, and for the same question, I will also want to ask um, Professor Mazzeni, um, what has been your most important or significant work in your field? Um, honestly, with all the things that I've heard, uh, I feel so humble to say anything. It's just uh, because my research is not even remotely effective as these women, you know, are doing. And, you know, the effect that the direct impact they have on, on people's lives is not really comparable to what I call like achievement or so I'm not going to talk anything about like any personal achievement or because it's it's nothing compared to what they are saying so the only thing that I sure hope that I can accomplish is to just play a role model for those female students and you know other professionals who are here in the United States which is way way different from what these women are experiencing, you know, other parts of the world is that um, that it give them it, it will give them the courage to go and experience something that is out of their comfort zone. So I had like a student um, two years ago, two years ago, I think one and a half years ago that she was offered a job at a construction company and she was hesitant to take it because uh, she said that every single person in the committee that interviewed her were, were white males. And she wasn't sure if she should accept it because she was, uh, she was a person of color. And when I shared my experience, you know, in the company that I worked for, and I told her that everybody was the same, um, you know, white, uh, male <laughs> colleagues and nobody would take me seriously at first but then they started respecting my expertise and you know experience that convinced her to take the job and I'm very happy to say that she's very successful in her job right now so these are like little things that I can mention as achievement I, I can't even say achievement uh, like some sort of impact on on women and girls but in my research, I'm hoping that what we do will, uh, for example, prevent what we saw happen in Texas in February 2020, 
um, that you know everything like the the uh, because of the cold weather, the natural gas didn't work, and then power plants were shut off, and then the water was shut off. Everybody was. This is exactly what I do for my research that I study like the impact of one infrastructure on another one when there is a disaster. So uh, I'm hoping that the result of what we do will prevent things like this in in the future. But again, um, I'm too humble to say that uh, I have achieved anything in my life compared to what I heard like from other panelists. But uh, well, thank you all really. I mean, um, <laughs> power to you all for what you're doing in the world. So really, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. And um, we have a, um, a question from um, Anne's. Um, she's, asked, she's wondering, can Dr. Farrow tell us more about resilience of interlinked critical infrastructure and whether um, you know about similar studies in Africa? And we're also running about out of time a little bit here. So if you could give a brief answer and response, that would be great. Thank you. Of course, yeah. Um, I haven't done any studies in, in Africa, but I believe that what we are studying is global. So, uh, for example, I just give you some very simple example that uh, all the water that we use uh, at home, they have to be treated before we use them. And all the treatment processes require electricity and some sort of energy, which means that the water system is depending on the power plants and the energy system. So if the power plant is out of you know, order, for some reason, there is no power. You, you can't really treat the water and you cannot use drinking water, clean water. So that's how they are related to each other. And the same thing for, for, for example, the buildings. The buildings require water and electricity. If one of them is out, your H, not H, uh, HVAC is something that cools and heats your house. So that will be out of order. So we are saying that all of these infrastructures are related. And if you want to have a resilient system, we need to make sure that all of them, that all the interlinks are considered while you're studying them. So I, I think that's the shortest answer I can say. Thank you, Professor Mazzini. Um, and um, our last question, um, I'll direct this to Anne James. Um, what is, um, what are some key actions? Do you, what key actions do you think need to be taken to enable women's full participation in decision making to address climate change, disaster relief, and mitigation? Um, hello. From my um, limited experience, what I can say is that as women, we need to support each other. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. I oh, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, many of us are in, um, live in very patriarchal societies. Okay. And uh, sometimes this is actually um, internalized in, in women's mindset. So many times women find it hard to, to uh, speak out and to come together and stand up for uh, their rights, for the uh, cultural and um, uh, climate rights that are theirs too. Uh, so I think it's about supporting one another and it's about coming together around common concerns. So um, being able to, uh, as we have already heard from some of the other presentations, um, pooling our, our experience, our know-how, our skills, and being able to share that in such a way that there is uh, an incremental uh, uh, growth and, and well-being for members and um, definitely the women also their children uh, in, in the societies we are part of. So it's about really being there for one another. Um, it's about also uh, becoming more vocal, I think, in, in, um, in how we approach climate justice and are able to focus on um, how much it impacts us as women. Okay, when I was speaking about my experience with women religious, we did a lot of work around uh, awareness raising about the, the whole ecological crisis that we're facing in Zambia as elsewhere. Um, now, when I, when I think of the farms I worked with, they were mostly focused on, on their um, you day-to-day know, -day, uh, survival needs. I think uh, as, as we learn them, they will also have to, um, as we have seen with the students in, in other projects, um, grow into the awareness that they are actually doing their bit to, um, to transform 
and to pass on this, um, the legacy they have received, the land, uh, the connection with the soil to those coming after them and to the girls and the women uh, they, share their, they share their lives with. That's how I see it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, we also want to open up this question for our other speakers. So I'll repeat the question again. What key actions do you think need to be taken to enable women's full participation in decision making to address climate change, disaster relief, and mitigation? Um, does any other speakers want to speak up for this question? If not, I'll pass on to Elizabeth Sullivan to wrap up our um, webinar today. And thank you all for joining with us today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a very good day. All right, uh, thank you everyone for attending and participating in custodians of the, our common home, the voices of women countering climate change. We would like to thank all six of our wonderful panelists for presenting on the topic of climate change and sharing their story with us. We greatly appreciate your passion, energy, and knowledge today. We would also like to thank our host organizations for designing and producing this event. We hope that everyone leaves today feeling inspired, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of CSW 66. Thanks everyone.